So we're here to talk about eschatology. It's a wonderful, wonderful, fun word. It sounds so important. Um, and what does it mean? It's, it's, it's uh, from the Greek word um, eska, uh, which means the end of things, the last things, and ology means the study of. So it's the study of the last things. And so we tend to associate that with this concept of the end of the world and the end of things as we know it, and, and the beginning of a new world. And this, this tends to be associated with books like Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel and a lot of Isaiah too. And there's, there's sort of a wonder about that. So let's, um, I want to say uh, three things before I begin. Three things we're going to think about when we start to look at books like, we'll spend some time in Revelation and some time in Daniel, and we're going to kind of think about what that looks like and what end times kind of stuff looks like. The first thing I want to say is when we discuss something like Revelation, the book of Revelation, you know, my my dad always said he loved Revelation. It was his favorite book because it had, you know, horned animals and beasts in it and things like that. And and he liked the 666 thing. In fact, when my sister was little, he used to torment her by like looking at her and seeing if he could find the 666 mark anywhere on her scalp. Um, Because he liked, there's kind of a horror film almost vibe to it. And sometimes that's what people think. They think of sort of the judgment and the negativity. But remember, this is not the revelation of how horrible the end of the world is. Um, Revelation 1-1 tells us the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's, and if you've got your Bibles, we'll just look at Revelation 1. Um, that's how it opens up. It says, John says, before anything else, what is about to be revealed is Jesus Christ. This is it. By the end of this book, the thing you should know better than anything else is Jesus. That should be the reality. The thing we have to remember about, and I'm just going to read it because it's so powerful. This is how it opens. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must soon take place. He made known by sending his angel to the servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the word of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and keep what is written, for the time is near. John to the seven churches of Asia, grace and peace from him who is and him who was and who him is to come and from the seven spirits that are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of earth to him who he loved and who loves us has freed us from the sin by his blood made us kings and kingdom of a high priest of God and the father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he is coming on the clouds every eye is going to see him even those who pierced him all the tribes uh, will wail on account of him even so I am the alpha and the omega says the Lord God the who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. Woo! What an opening. That's a cracker of it. That grabs your attention right there. What a movie opening. This is about Jesus, to know him better, to declare his greatness. And that's what we have to want to look at. I would say this. If reading this book doesn't make you more like Jesus, you're reading it wrong. If you read this book as a secret code to figure out all the intricacy things of what's happening in the way of the world that's causing things to end, you've missed it. We should know Jesus better at the end of this. Um, The next thing I want to say, and the study of end times, is this. Today is the end times for so many people. There can almost be this thing in Christianity, and cults do this quite a bit, they get you more excited to say, it's coming really soon, bro. I think we've six months left. We got to move or it's going to be on this date. It's going to be on this date. Are you ready? You got to give more. You got to go out and evangelize more. And it freaks you out with this impending reality of the end of the world. Here's a, here's a crazy truth. All of our worlds could end tomorrow. The neighbor who has never heard the gospel might be thinking suicidal thoughts today. Someone who is old and doesn't have anyone to visit them might not have long for this world. So many people, their end times is right here, right now. People who are suffering and dying in the world today, it is their end times right here, right now. 
Don't let a concept of end times lead you into this false sense of, I've still got time to, before I have to get serious about evangelism and ministry. End times are right here and right now. And the final thing I'll say on this, and a little different, the most wonderful words you can use when interpreting the end times and book of Revelation are, I don't know. Ignorance is the beginning of education. People who know everything tend to be the dumbest because they have nothing to learn. So as we read this, we're not going to get into, oh, it's like this and it's like this, that there's anything very strict in it. It's just trying to illuminate things as best we can. Okay, so any thoughts before we go on or questions? I, what I'd like to do right now, and I'll just write up here, um, end times, and I want everyone or whoever it is to shout out what you associate with the concept of end times. What words jump to mind? And if you're, if you're um, online, please feel free to comment and we can have them shout out there. Oh yes, we've got this wonderful Sunday school teacher teaching their uh, befuddled kids. Eschatology, any thoughts? I like that. So eschatology, any thoughts? What comes to your mind when you think of end times? Go ahead and shout something out. What's that? Oh, I like it. Yes, the mark of the beast. Oh, mark of the beast. This is a big one. We'll talk about that. All right, judgment. We had another huge in, uh, in end times. Absolutely. Go ahead, keep shouting. Rapture. Oh, we'll have a good chat about the rapture. Absolutely. Oh, yep, any others? Oh, I like that. I got one. Last chance. That's a good one. Last chance. I was at, okay, I'll keep writing here. White horse. Oh, lovely, lovely. I put down the four horsemen. Um, and uh, I'm, what, I, I missed one there. Was it prophecy? prophecy? Yes, okay, wonderful. Anything else? Dig deep there. Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. I'm going to put down disasters here. <laughs> <laughs> to save my back. Uh, yeah, tribulation. tribulation, yes. All right, any others? Ooh. Now that's an interesting... The new world order. I'll put that down, the W. Ooh, now, now we're getting into something very interesting. The one world government. Okay, let's do that. One world. Oh, I've got my things right here. All right, anything? Uh, what, did I miss? What did I miss here? Did I miss anything else? Seven seals. Seven seals. Yes. Oh, that's an interesting one. The lay. If I can remember that. The Laodiceans. Yes, good one. Any other, any other words? What will you think of when you think end times? Or 144. That's a good one. Yes, absolutely. 144,000. Absolutely. Anything else? The Antichrist. Absolutely. Yep. That's the big one. Oh, the old Antichrist. Fall of Babylon. Huge. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad we're doing this. You guys are so smart. I have nothing else to teach you here. Okay, anything else? Four horsemen we have. Anything else that uh, that's, uh, jumps out to you at all? Go ahead. Yes, oh yes, absolutely. Put that here. As Satan put in chains for, the, for a thousand years, but released for a short period. Yes, anything? Go ahead, sir. The thousand year reign. Oh, I love that. We'll call it, I love that. It's a wonderful The millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign. Uh, the millennial. Oh, there we go. of self. Absolutely. Anything else? Seven churches. 
Anything else? Go ahead. Oh, yes, well, we'll put that here, and we'll put the an Antichrist as well down here. And we'll put false prophets. Okay. All right, so we any more? Oh, brilliant. I like that we have the nice things in here too, you know? <laughs> it does have a happy ending. Any others? Oh, yes, the, the dece yes, the deception. Okay, any others? Okay, I feel that, that's, that's, a, that's plenty to start with. I, I, you know, was, I got to, um, as it was, I drove here, I actually just stuck on the Rev book of Revelation as an audio book, so I just, it's all very fresh in my brain, and it's, it's a short book, and it's a fun thing to do, you know, you stick that on your phone, and it's, oh, it's great. Okay, so, wow, we've got such good stuff here, such really, really wonderful things. So, um, let's go to the, the next slide here as we go forward. Oh, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a second here. Um, it's a complicated book. And one thing I, I do often think about, the more we study the Bible, I often think about when Jesus was interacting with the Pharisees, how did they not get who he was? And part of it was they had basically like, these are people who knew the Bible, they knew everything, but they couldn't imagine Jesus showing up in the way that he sh showed up. That was so outside of the realm of existence that they missed it. They, they put Jesus in a box, and anything outside of that box has to be rejected. And so as we're studying Revelation, as we're studying what God is planning to do, something we have to begin with, and that's really most of what we're going to do tonight, is start to think of things a little bit outside of the box. And there's four ways that people will interpret books like Revelation and Daniel. And the first way we're going to talk about is um, what is called preterism. And preterism, pret, is, uh, it's, it's a Greek word for past. And what it basically means is most of end times events in books of like Revelation and Daniel, are describing things that have already happened. And so basically, generally what it's talking about now, Daniel is describing kingdoms like Babylonians, Assyrians, and Rome. And it's describing their fall as something in the past, something that's already happened. And Revelation is basically describing um, the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, and for those of you who've heard, who, who here has heard of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Okay, most, most everyone. I'll just take a few minutes to go over really what happened there. About um, 66 um, AD, uh, about uh, 30 or so years after Jesus has ascended into heaven, there, uh, there's a massive rebellion in Rome, huge rebel groups, and they basically say, these tiny, this tiny little country said, we're going to take on the Roman Empire. And there were other people in Rome said, or in Jerusalem said, absolutely, you're not. Don't be so stupid. And they said, nope, we are. And they start to fight, and they go out, and they kill a bunch of soldiers. Well, Rome invades. And what happens next is three and a half years of the most bloody, brutal war, really, that anyone had seen in a very long time. It was vicious, and it was despicable. Death is one thing. But the ways in which people die are really quite awful. Um, Josephus uh, was a very he's probably the most famous Jewish historian who lived at that time, and he was one of the rebels. He was one of, who wanted to fight against Rome, and then he saw the size of the Roman army and their power and said, yeah, I think I've changed my mind, and he stood outside of Jerusalem as it was, as it was rebelling and said, please, please surrender or you're about to suffer unlike anything you've ever known. And the people in Jerusalem shout back at him, you're just trying to save your own wife and kids who are in this city. And he said, send out my wife and children, I'll kill them personally. Because if they stay in that city, they're going to die anyway. This was the level of suffering that had happened. People were, were starving, and there was um, people who would roam around um, and, and like rob people's houses looking for food. And, and this kind of came to a head until one woman, a Jewish woman in Jerusalem, actually killed and cooked her infant child. 
And when the smell of, of the cooking flesh hit people, all these bandits ran to the house and saw what she was doing and were so horrified and so convicted of their sin, it led to transformation. So many people were crucified. They basically cut down all of the wood in Israel. They burnt all the crops. So when we read things in, in Revelation, like the trees were destroyed, the grass was destroyed, the crops were destroyed, someone could look at this and say, yes, that looks like Israel. So when you're surrounded on all, end, all sides, that's what happened to Israel. So a lot of people looked at this and said, that's what happens. So the Romans go in after three and a half years, burn Jerusalem to the ground. They say, Israel is done. Judaism is done. Your temple is done. Now we name this place Palestine, which was an insulting word because the greatest enemies of the Israelites were the Philistines, and they're saying, this is, Philist this is Philistine land now. That's why the Palestinians are our Palestinians. And so people look at this and say, the end times is describing uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And when you look at things, when you read the words of Jesus um, in uh, Luke 21, he actually says this. He says the end times is going to be related to the destruction of Jerusalem. I'll just read a, a few verses from that. Um, if I can find it here. Yep. Uh, Verse, yep, in verse 5, and he, he talks about this. He says, while some of them were speaking of the temple, how well adorned it was with noble stones and offerings, um, Jesus says, as for these things, the day will come when there won't be one stone left on another. And they said, when's this going to be? And he said, what will the sign be about this place? And he said, see that you're not led astray, for many will come saying, I am he, time is at hand. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and tumults, don't be afraid. This must, things must first take place, uh, but the end will not be at once. It's basically saying it will be around this time. So how many of you, as I'm reading this, think that um, preterism makes absolutely no sense? Okay. And then, yes. And why would you say, and you would just care to share why at all? No, okay. Israel. Israel, why Israel? Because that was who the Antichrist were and that uh, that was used during the Antichrist. Exactly, yes. So a lot of people say Israel plays such a big role, God would never sort of allow this destruction. But people would read it and say, well, Israel wasn't really needed anymore. The temple wasn't needed. Because there was a time when basically the only way to get to God was to be super holy and then sacrifice and then be a priest and then you could get into God's presence. But now when Jesus died, we're soaked in the blood. The temple of the Holy Spirit is now our hearts. So God was destroying that because it's a new age. That's what they would say. I'm not saying I agree. Throwing it out there. <laughs> um, any other thoughts? Why does this not make sense to you? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. And some people would say he wasn't talking about 70 AD, the temple was being destroyed, and then later gets, will be rebuilt, which we'll talk about, and that's the destruction of which he's speaking. So, yes, absolutely, fair point. So, um, this is, so, so this is kind of thing, so we see a lot of stuff, but when you read Revelation, it does read like a historical account of the destruction of Jerusalem. It talks about the destruction of the temple. It talks about uh, people running out into the caves and saying, let the rocks fall upon us. And, and when you actually read the destruction of Jerusalem, there were Jews and Christians that ran out of the city and tried to hide in the caves because they knew what was happening. So these things do look very much like, um, you, could, you could read it and you could get that from it. But the one thing for me, which kind of doesn't make sense, when, with something like this, and this is kind of the, i just go to the next slide here. If preterism is true, if most of the events in Revelation kind of, and what they're saying is that basically all the bad stuff has already happened, now we're kind of getting into the church age where things are going to be good, and then Jesus is going to come eventually, whenever. Um, but Revelation 1.1 tells us the revelation which God gave to show the servants all the things which must soon take place. It's telling you something that's going to happen in the future. Now, most scholars and most evidence would say Revelation was written in 90 AD, 20 years after the events of the destruction of Jerusalem, um, which would mean 
John would be one of those guys saying, oh, I have a great prophecy of you of something that happened 20 years ago. I see a vision of the Lord. Worst prophecy ever. I've definitely seen people do, you know. I did have a guy come up to me. We met him before in a cafe, and then we went to church, and he was like, we were talking to him in the cafe, and he came up and like prophesied all this knowledge that we just told him like an hour earlier in a cafe. So it does happen. Um, but yes, this would be a kind of a crummy prophecy on the part of John. Some people say uh, that John actually wrote this in around 60 AD, and there's some, there are some, there's about, there's about 30 people that s tell us when John wrote Revelation it, and from early on. Most of them say 90, two or three say he wrote it in 60. So if he wrote it in 60, preterism is still good. It's still a prophecy. If he writes it in 90, it's not really a prophecy, as we would understand a prophecy. So things like that. So this is where preterism kind of comes into play. And we're going to look at preterism. We're going to go a little deep into it as we go along. And any thoughts or questions about preterism before we move on? I'm sorry, I do talk very fast. So is anyone a bit lost? <laughs> yeah, I listen to Revelation, but I listen to books on double speed. So it's, as you may have noticed, I'm starting to pick up bad habits. <laughs> okay, well, we'll keep moving on. Another way to read, and this actually the picture behind there is, oh, that's quant. We're going to look at idealis, um, idealism. The book, the idea that Revelation and Daniel are a book of ideas and images, and they represent something. So let's talk a little bit about that. Everything in the book of Revelation and Daniel is a metaphor for something else. Now, this is going to be a little different. Some people want to interpret um, literally. Others want to say, let's make this metaphorical. And this is where idealism comes in. So let's talk, let's see if we can pick something here that we could say is metaphorical. The millennial kingdom. And in Revelation tells us about a kingdom God's going to establish on earth that's going to last a thousand years. Some people would say, no, God was talking, it doesn't mean a literal thousand year kingdom on earth. He means a very, very long time where the church is going to be established and the church is basically going to take over the world to make it better. Because when, because the word thousand is often metaphorical. There's the Bible verse where God says, I have the cattle on earth, your father has a cattle on a thousand hills. It doesn't literally mean God has cattle on a thousand hills. It means he owns everything. He's very wealthy and if God needs to provide, he can provide. So some people would say this, something like the millennial kingdom is just a metaphor for something else. Um, for example, the white horse, there's not actually going to be four horsemen of the apocalypse. There's not, we're not going to see them riding in the sky, a white horse and a red horse and a green horse. What it's saying is that Jesus is going to come on a white horse or the emperor, whoever it would be, and then war is going to come and then disease is going to come and that's what it's going to look like. The, the, the whole thing of end times is metaphorical. 144,000. The Bible says that there's 144,000 names written in, in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is there literally 144,000, which the Jehovah's Witnesses tell us, yes, there is? No, there isn't. Of course not. It's, and this is, I, I was Jehovah's Witness for a number of years, and I remember having this conversation. Some of them said, only 144 Christians are going, 144,000 Christians are going to heaven. And I said, oh, really? And they said, yep. And I said, is that metaphorical or is that literal? And they said, it's literal. I said, okay. It says 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 from the tribe of Dan, 12,000. And I went through this and said, so it's 144, it's 12, it's 144,000 Jews are going to heaven. They're like, no, no, Jehovah's Witnesses. That's not what it says. Oh, well, that 144,000 is literal and the 12,000 are all metaphorical. Yeah. Okay. It can't be both. Yes, 144,000 means 12 by 12 by 1,000. Way bigger numbers than you can imagine. God's chosen people, the 12, times by 12, um, times 1,000. It's just a huge number. That's what it's trying to say. So yes, this is a way to interpret Revelation and um, Daniel. It's all a metaphor. And that makes sense. If you read the book of Revelation, it says like about 50 times. It doesn't say there were beasts that have the face of a lion or the face of an eagle it said he has a face like a man or face like a lion. So like is a, is a huge, is, is an, a word that you use, use repeatedly in the book of Revelation. It's a, it's a metaphor for something else. And prophecies throughout the Bible look like that. They, they are visions. 
they are dreams. One thing represents another thing. When Pharaoh has a dream about, you know, um, seven skinny cows eating up seven fat cows, they're not literal cows. They represent seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So when we read this thing, it's very, it's wonderful because it says everything we read is a metaphor. Everything represents something else. And it, this is great because we don't have to date it. You don't have to say it's going to happen at this time or this time. And this is the view that most people who are biblical scholars, who are very well versed in Bible, hold to this view of idealism. Um, it also speaks to us in a wonderful way because we can look at that for ourselves today. If you are a Syrian refugee and you pick up this wonderful book of Revelation, and you think of those monsters and demons tearing you away from your home and the area that you love, you can look at this and you can say, one day, God's going to tear down that Babylon. If, if, if you're, if you're the, the victim of war or victim of starvation or victim of domestic abuse or, or, um, or, or, or racial injustice, you can look at it and say, one day, God's going to tear down this Babylon. One day, a kingdom is going to rise, the kingdom of God, and it's going to look like Jesus. It's going to look like charity. It's going to look like mercy. It's going to look like truth. It's going to look like healing, and, 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 and it won't be the rich and the powerful. It's going to be the weak and the, the hungry and the peacemakers that are going to rule this place, and it's going to be perfect. You can read these words and get something, and you can say, yes. That's what I long for, whatever situation you're in. A very famous example was when um, in, in colonial uh, times in the USA, they, um, uh, they, they were trying to make the slaves uh, more docile and more obedient. So they said, well, let's give them the Bible. That will make them better servants because it talks about serving your master. And if they read the Bible, they'll be better servants. But what did they read? They read the book of Exodus. And they read how, God, how their, their people were enslaved. And the one day God led them out of it. And they said, yes, that's us. God's going to free us one day. And they said, what the? Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Hello, Pharaoh, to let my people go. This is where idealism is wonderful because it speaks to us. And it challenges us. When you look at Revelation and you say, oh, that's talking about somebody else, idealism challenges you and it says, is there a little fallen Babylon in me? Am I, do I represent Jesus in the world? What about my community? Is it Babylonian? you know? What about, what is my, does my church share something like this? Does my family, and, and it challenges us. It goes into something it's internal as opposed to very external signs. That's why idealism is a very powerful way to read it. Some people also call it historicism. And it says Daniel and Revelation are just an explanation of history. And so people like John, uh, John Calvin and Martin Luther, the reformers, they love this idea because they, they said the Antichrist is the Pope and the false prophet is his bishops. And they, they, imply, they read their portion of history into it and said we're just part of this flow of history. So this is why it's a wonderful way uh, to read the Bible. But it is not perfect. Uh, we have some cons here in the next slide. It's very subjective. Anything can be um, fallen Babylon. I had someone tell me recently, um, what was it? He said, oh, well, fallen Babylon is, 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 is uh, my lack of health care. No, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. I was, I was teaching this in uh, Eastern Europe, and there were American students there, and I was walking uh, to, uh, to the class through the courtyard, and, and a student stopped me, and this was a few years back, he said, he said, oh, well, our country just re-elected the Antichrist last night. I was like, oh, good to know. That should speed things up a little bit. Um, but we, we, we pull anything we want, and you can pull it into that. This is, this is often, it's not really prophecy. It, when, it, when it can be anything, it ends up being nothing. And it also sparked a thing called Constantinianism. And that's the idea that the church should run the government and the church should run things. And that was the idea that basically a lot of people read this and said, yes, the kingdom of God is fallen Babylon. So all the countries that are pagan, they're Babylon, 
And then if we basically, the church runs the government and the church, king is a Christian and we do Christian-y things and we make non-Christian-y things illegal, then that looks like the kingdom of God. And that has led to a lot of problems. That's led, led the church to seek power and wealth and pros, uh, prestige. And some horrible things have come, some good things have come out of it, some horrible things generally. So that is uh, what we would call idealism. So any, let's stop here. Any thoughts or questions before we go on? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, um, yeah, so some you, people would look at that and say, it has to be speaking about a literal place because people are having literal conversations about it. They're looking at it happen. They're saying, oh, no, we made all this money and now our main customer's gone. This makes it look very literal. Uh, uh, a, uh, an idealist would say, well, every time an empire falls, people look at it and have conversations. It's not talking about one particular place. It's talking about all the falls of all the empires because all empires fall. Um, you know, the Roman Empire fell, the Scandinavian Empire fell, the British Empire fell. Um, many last years, Egypt, Egypt and China lasted 2,000 years. America, how long will America last? We don't know. Hopefully for many, many years to come because it is a wonderful nation. But um, questions like this definitely come into it because they do all fall. And that's the, the thing Revelation calls you to remember. No matter how big you are, when God decides you're done, you're done. Now, we can accomplish anything. How about a meteorite? <laughs> how about your water supply is poisoned? How about um, a plague that comes through? How about locusts that sting you? There's, you don't really, actually, we, we still, as wonderful as we are, as we're learning in this day and age, we can't do much to fight nature. You know, with all our incredible technology, a plague is sweeping across our country. We're doing great in dealing with it, and we could be doing better. That's a whole different subject. But, but we can't fight it. As, as intelligent as we are, we can view the atom, but uh, can't stop a plague that is going from person to person. These things, they, they make us humble. We, history should make us humble to see greater nations than ourselves have fallen by making stupid decisions and, and uh, dirty decisions. Any, any other thoughts? Either I've explained it really well or you're all very confused. And I do fear the latter. <laughs> yeah. How about anyone here? Does this speak to anyone when you say, yes, something about this kind of clicks with me a little bit. Maybe I, I like to read it like this or it's different. Or, or someone says, this is the dumbest stuff I've ever heard. Go ahead. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, the, and we love to do this in, a, in theology. We love, to, we love our boxes. I've got this wonderful book called The Four Views of the Atonement. And one view says Jesus died to atone for our sins, to erase our sins. Other people say, no, he didn't do that. He died to defeat evil and defeat death at the Christus Victor. Other people say he died to, to show us how we're supposed to suffer. And, and, and the book was like, which side are you? And I'm like, yes, all of them. They're all wonderful and magnificent, yes. So it can give us a great overview like that, absolutely. Yeah. And any other thoughts? Go ahead, sir. I agree with it, but I think from it being literal and from looking metaphorically, mm -hmm. the revelation of Jesus Christ helps me get that metaphor taken back to the Bible. Well, revelation of Jesus Christ, so. is it, though? Does it speaks of Jesus having hair as white as snow and, and feet that are like uh, polished bronze and fr you know there's there's fire around him and from his mouth comes a two-edged sword. These are not literal depictions. You know his hair is white because he is so wise. Jesus is so old and his feet are like bronze because they're pure and nothing will ever stand in their way. You know, you've got some brass shoes on, bronze shoes. You're crushing everything in sight. 
And his, his tongue is not literally a sword. It's that the word that came from Jesus was so powerful, it could cut you in two. So, yes, it, it's, liter- it's describing, it's metaphorically describing a literal Jesus. Yeah. It's, oh, I feel like I'm nodding up <laughs> a big ball of yarn here in, in a way that's it's impossible to get out. Yeah. Any other thoughts? <laughs> good, good. Yes, the power of I don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, but what's that old song? It's the end of the world as we know it. Well, is it? And, and you bring up an excellent point. And this is where idealism comes into something quite interesting. Oh, actually, we can go to the next slide here. Um, so this is what idealism looks like. It says that Jesus destroys Satan at this point. Satan is, just, is, is restrained. When Jesus died on the cross, Jesus beat the devil when he walked out of the grave, which is true. And it says, this thousand-year reign of God began the day Jesus walked out of the grave. And it starts the church age. And it was the job of the church to make the world a little bit more like heaven. And that's what we do as Christians. Where there is sickness, we bring healing. Where there is Conflict, we bring peace. Where there is falsity, we bring truth. Where there is judgment, uh, we bring uh, mercy. You know, where there is life or death, we're supposed to bring life. We're supposed to basically make the world look a little bit more like heaven. And it said for a thousand years, the church is supposed to do that. And going hand in hand with that, Christians are going to be horribly persecuted. Now, here's the question. Has, have Christians made the world a better place? We say no. Tell me why. Yeah, we can be real jerks. Yeah, right. Any other thoughts? Have Christians made the world a better place? What you believe? Yes. So, so well, go ahead. You said yes. Can I tell you something that's fascinating? Beyond any question of a doubt, looking at history, the church has been the greatest force of good the world has ever seen. And I believe that is indisputable. We have built more hospitals, more orphanages, more schools than any group in history can even touch. You're here studying the Bible while simultaneously buying a hundred bags of toys for people you have never met. How amazing is that? Other people aren't doing that, brothers and sisters. Why? Because thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These kids deserve to see a little bit of heaven in their lives, and I'm going to make a sacrifice to make that happen. Right now, you are doing something to make people's dark world look a little bit more like heaven. You are doing something to change the fallen Babylon into the kingdom of God. Christians do this again and again. When a nation that adopts Christian values of charity will automatically have a higher standard of living than those that don't. Because we believe in mercy. That's why we have welfare, why we have hospitals, why we have education. And we don't believe in those things as privileges. They're rights. You should have them because you're made in the image of God. If you lived in India and you were living in squalor and poverty and the Christians showed up, great, they're going to build a hospital, they're going to build a school, they're going to say, no, you can't throw a living bride on the funeral pyre with her husband, that's cruel and wicked. 
The wife of the dead, the recently widowed lady will be like, thank God for the Christians. We make the world a much better place wherever we go. As we're saying, we want to go to Japan, and that's our whole vision. Let's, let's shine a little bit of Jesus into somebody's life who's living in dark fall in Babylon. At the same time, we are persecuted mercilessly. All around the world today, people are dying in these insane numbers for their Christian faith. People who said, you know, repent, you know, recant Jesus or die. Say, no, I'll die in the millions and the billions. You know, we talk about the end times that we're going to know. What will we do when, when the end times begin? I have a question for you. If the end times began tomorrow, would the Christians in Syria notice? Probably they're, they're living it. For millions of people right now, they're, they're in a season of tribulation that looks very much like the end times. For the first generations of Christians who are being fed to the lions or having their um, organs chopped off, the tribulation was not a distant event. It was very, very real. So someone would look at this and say, the Christian kingdom, the millennial kingdom, which is trying to make the world a bit more like heaven, is, um, is happening while at the same time, Christians are, are suffering, and, and people all around the world are suffering this kind of tribulation. And in some ways, you can look at that. You can read where Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and, de and deceivers, and uh, there's going to be earthquakes and, and famines. And people say, oh, when's that going to happen? Uh, did you, like, read the newspaper today? Uh, right now. That's kind of like a typical day on planet Earth. So are you with me? This is kind of how an idealist would, would read these things, or a historicist, so... Oh, okay, I'm not going to burn the heretic yet. We're doing good. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions before we move on from that? Or, yeah, just tell me what, what you're thinking or if you have any thoughts on it, questions. As my teachers used to say, thoughts, questions, or dirty limericks. Okay, okay. So we'll crack on here, and the next one we're going to talk about is, um, is futurism. Um, this might actually be another thing of kind of the millennial kingdom. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll crack on here uh, for the next one here. So yeah, uh, next slide. Yes, futurism. The belief that the events in Revelation and, and parts of Daniel describe future events. That this book has not yet been, been fulfilled and it is still to come. And this would be what most uh, Christians and probably most pastors would read when we read the book of Revelation. And that's very natural. Because we tend to read a book and we put ourselves in the way of the, uh, of the, the protagonist. You know, my, my girls love uh, princess movies. And of course, they're the princess. And they have to have the Elsa dress and the Anna dress and because they're sisters. So they have to be said. And they, sing the, they always sing the songs of the main person because that's who you need to be. And so when we read this, we read it and we say, this could happen to us. This could be in our lifetime. That's a natural way to read things. Um, and so it, it, there's, there's a lot to this. One of the things that looks to it, it, it gives us a future hope. And there's something beautiful in that. We can say one day, because I, I think we all have, have looked, experienced horrible injustice in our life. And we've looked at the world and we've seen horrible injustice. And you look and you say, how could this happen? And you read this book and you say one day, my God's going to make all this right. And your power might have, you, you may have won an ashen victory today, but one day you'll stand before my God. I, um, I, when we were in Moldova, we, uh, we worked in a, a home. I lived there for a couple of years, and we worked in a home for women who'd been victims of, of human trafficking into prostitution. And, uh, and I used to love to preach to them God's judgment. And there was something so comforting in it because I would tell them, I want you to know God is furiously angry at the people who enslaved you. God is furiously angry like a father. He is angry at those who have abused his daughters. And he's wrapping his arms around you and loving you and he's telling you, I'm going to get those guys for you. And they took a sweet comfort in that. And then, a little girl, 
was uh, I suppose three or four, and she would have been conceived while her, her mother was enslaved in sex slavery. And uh, uh, she was praying before she went to bed. And she said, and Lord, bless my daddy and help him to know Jesus. And there was a beat. One day I'd like to be as good a Christian as that three-year-old girl. <laughs> this beauty of the mix of God's incredible judgment and incredible mercy swirls together inside of us, calls out to us. We, we look at this book and we say, it's got to be a future thing. One day there has to be an answer for those who have done terrible things, for those who have abused and hurt people, for those who have da damaged and broken our world, for those who have created weapons to, 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 to kill and destroy. It's something about it cries out in us, God, come fix this. Come, Lord Jesus, come. So futurism is, is a wonderful way. These events are still to come. And it makes this book relevant. It makes Revelation relevant. It's why we cry out, the end is nigh. Because we look at the state of the world and we say, God, could it possibly get more evil? How long, Lord? How long? And we cry out and we look at the way people are suffering in the world today. Good people, lovely people. I mean, not perfect people, but people made in the image of God. And we cry out, how long, Lord? How long? And so this is a, there's something wonderful in futurism. And it's, it, it inspires us. We create wonderful, there's been great books and paintings that have come out of it. Uh, the Left Behind series. Anyone a Left Behind fan? Ooh, okay, I got some there. <laughs> there are some great ideas that come out of this thing of a future judgment. And there's something that's creative and, and wonderful about it. Um, but it's got problems. A big one is how many of you have heard a false prophecy about God's coming in the next three months or something like that. I was sitting in a seminar one time and the pastor declared a date for the end of the world. And I said, brother, don't you know that the Lord said no one knows the hour of the day? And he said to me, yes, indeed, but he doesn't say anything about the month and the year. <laughs> Well, that month and that year passed, and he was very wrong. And most people are wrong. I think, gosh, we'd be someone in 2015 waiting for the end of the world. And uh, oh, they're all the time. Egypt's are waiting for the end of the world and calling it this day, that day. And 2012 had some big ones. I think it was like an end of the world movie. That, oh, the, the Mayan calendar. That was a brilliant one. Oh, my favorite. What was it? Oh, the Millennium Bug, the 2000 thing. And oh, that was very good. That was a, that was a personal favorite of mine. Um, yes. And so this, it's led to some banana people, who everything is the Antichrist, and every little thing, oh, well, this movement here is the Antichrist, and uh, this, this happened to me in seminary, where, where a guy was pointing out, the European Union is the movement of the Antichrist, anyone hear that one before? Yep, that's a popular one, and he said, there are, there are 10 member seats of the European Union, like the 10 horns in Revelation, to which I put up my hand and said, sir, there are 12 uh, seats in the European Union. Well, there used to be 10. There has never been 10. It went from 9 to 12 overnight. Three members joined at the same time, which crushed his theory a little bit. Um, but we, we, we've seen these things, these sensational conspiracy theories. I often get people like emailing me this thing where it's like, if you take this number and this number and this number, it adds up to 666 and there's craziness. And it can be anything. So people get a little crazy about this. I've heard, anyone heard, who have you heard is the Antichrist? Anyone that you've heard, you've heard someone claim that they're the Antichrist. Anyone want to give me a shout out on that one? Obama. Obama. He, he was very popular as being the Antichrist. Yes. Yes. Well, he, he got uh, eight years, not seven. So, <laughs> no, I don't think we're... Anyone else got a good one for the Antichrist? The Pope. The Pope is a very popular character for the... I, 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 I like Francis. I don't think it's him. Any others there? Go ahead. Oh, yes, the president's son-in-law. No. Oh, yeah, there we are. Is, is, uh, the there you go. Yeah, well, there we go. I'll have to, well, there you go. He's a, he's a suspicious looking one. <laughs> Being there. Any others, folks? <laughs> I'm running by. George Soros. George Soros. Yeah, he's a, he's a favorite of the conspiracy theorists. Yes, he's, a, yes, he's like a, a, a Jewish banker and... Uh, Yes, there's a horrible thing said about that man. I don't know him personally, but, you know, 
Yeah, there's a, he's, he's pop, and Jew, Jewish, it tends to be when Jewish people get very wealthy, they tend to attract a lot of conspiracy theories. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there was a recent rabbi in England that said that there are, uh, uh, there, he said there, we've counted that there are six Jews in all of China, which means there are, um, there are seven temples, and pretty soon someone's going to say we're running the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, candidates for the Antichrist? Every president has been labeled an antichrist, yes. Uh, the Pope, Billy Graham's had quite a few. Um, Ronald Reagan had a few. Um, you remember Malala Yosef, that wonderful young lady who was, who was shot by the Taliban for going to school. There was a lot. People were asking me is she because she was mortally wounded, and so people thought she was the antichrist, but no, I don't think so. Anyway, there's a lot of craziness out there. So, so it, it can... Uh, a lot of false prophecies. It also gets hijacked by political movements. Um, uh, if people are against something, uh, if, for people who are against globalization, for, for example, uh, as you talked about, Jared Kushner is working on a, a peace treaty in Israel. So people will say, well, he must be the Antichrist because anything to do with a peace treaty with Israel is of the Antichrist. Well, is it or it's that maybe you don't want a peace treaty, you kind of have a pro-Israel bent or something like that makes it look bad. Or people who would say if there's uh, like a treaties between different nations, we would say, oh, well, that's a one world government and I reject it. So sometimes it gets hijacked by political movements. Another thing it does, when you say that the world's going to be destroyed in the future, it can make you fatalistic. It can make you think well, the world's going to end one day, so what do I have to do about it? I, I've, I've heard that before. I was talking this, I was speaking on uh, peace and how Christians are called to, to make both political peace and per personal peace. And a lady came up to me afterward and she said, you cannot create peace. There'll be no peace until Jesus returns unless it's the false peace with the Antichrist. Well, that's a rather fatalistic way to look at the world. <laughs> Jesus said, go be peacemakers. Go create wonderful things. And she felt that because... There's a theory that the Antichrist will have a peace treaty that we shouldn't have peace. Uh, John MacArthur recently said, um, when he was asked about the environment, he said, this world is disposable because one day Jesus is going to make a new world. Well, that's a terrible way. To, so, we're, so we're not supposed to look after the world and make it better and improve it? I thought that was, we're the salts of the world. We're, we're the light of the world. We're here to make it better for people. And so this can be kind of a fatalistic uh, worlds. And some people say, you know, well, it w and, and I hear this a lot when we say, well, let's make something better. People say, well, it's a fallen world. What are you going to do? We're going to prop it back up again if it's fallen. That's what we're called to do as Christians, to make it better, to, to, to claim it back for Jesus, to make, to create a new image and make it better than it was before. So in this sense, um, it, uh, this kind of talk can be very, very fatalistic. A any, any thoughts on this? As well? Or have you ever heard talk like this or what are, you, what are your questions or anything like that? Oh, it's so quiet again. We'll see if it's, uh, is it explaining it too well or I've lost you? <laughs> yes. So anyway, I will go to the next slide here. So this is where some people who would be uh, futurists, they would kind of say this is where we are in Revelation, that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation. And that basically, at some points in the, tr uh, that God brings all these things down, and some people would say that in the future, um, the, is the temple of Israel is going to get rebuilt, and that will start a seven year, that there's going to be a peace treaty that the Antichrist is going to establish with Israel and other nations, that there'll be peace for three and a half years, in which time there will become a one world government, and then starts a... Um, the, the, the destruction of the world, the judgment and the tribulation for three and a half years. At the end of that, there's going to be the battle of Armageddon and the Christians are going to win and then starts the millennial kingdom. This will be a very popular way. Would anyone have heard that line of events before? Yeah, yeah, some of us. Okay, and that would kind of tends to be uh, the futurist way of looking at things. Okay, so, um, sorry, I lost all my things here at that. Okay, wonderful. So anyway, that's, I've, I've, I've already gone over time here a bit, so that's, uh, uh, how am I doing there? Oh, I'm t 10 minutes over. But th that's, uh, those are basically the, the three or four, if you look at historicism, ways of, of, of reading um, Revelation. And th that's just our introduction. 
what we'll do over the next few weeks is we'll kind of take sections of the scriptures and we'll look at them a little bit and try and interpret them through various other things. I have one other picture to show you here. Um, oh, we lost the picture. Oh, no bother. Okay, grand. And there's one other picture there. Yeah, we have another one here. Um, and what it's going to do, it, 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 we'll, we'll take sections of Daniel and Revelation, and we'll look at them historically. We'll look at them, uh, oh yes, this is the one I was discussing earlier. This is kind of, uh, there was sort of the age of the Israel, and then God brings in the age of the church. That will go on for however long. Then we've got our seven-year thing, and there'll either be a rapture at the beginning, at the middle, or the end, and then starts the millennial kingdom, and then on to final judgment. This will be kind of what most futurists, how they tend to interpret uh, the book of Revelation. Um, which, keep going there. So one way I'm going to look at this a little bit, I'm going to help us just take one section of Scripture, um, which is uh, Revelation 8. Revelation 8. I'll just read it out. We'll just kind of look at this a little bit for, we can read it in our historical and our, um, our, uh, our Revelation, where am I here? Oh, 9, sorry, verse 9, or chapter 9. And we'll read it kind of from a futurist perspective or an idealist perspective. Okay, so I'll read here in 9. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Chapter 9. And the fifth angel blew his trumpets and saw a star fallen from heaven to earth and was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke of the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth. They were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm uh, the grass or <coughs> of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but told only those who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. Their torment was like the torment of the scorpion when it stings someone. In those days, people will seek death and not find it. Um, they will long to die, but death will flee from them. In, the appearance, uh, uh, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like golden crowns. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair. Their teeth like a lion's teeth. And they had a breastplate like a breastplate of iron. Their um, I'm sorry, breastplate of iron. The noise in their wings was like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing into battle. They had tails um, with stings like scorpions and the power to hurt people for five months in their tails. Um, and they have as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Hebrew is Abaddon or Greek Apollyon. Now, what a futurist would say is imagine John was looking at a future event and he was describing something from the future he couldn't possibly imagine as being real. And he had to describe it. And so they looked at this and said, imagine for a second, John was describing a military helicopter. A military helicopter that's coming in, shooting all kinds of bombs or gas at people or napalm, something that maybe doesn't kill but can absolutely torture you. And how would he describe it? Well, you describe a... Um, uh, 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 a helicopter looking like this and said, oh, it had this like thing spinning above its head and it was like a woman's really long hair, but it was so loud. It was like, it was like chariots were rushing, but it had these teeth like lion's teeth because a lot of the um, helicopters have that design on them. It said, and it had the face of a man, which could have just been a man sitting in the cockpit. And so when it looks like this and you've got, you know, tons and tons of helicopters just charging at you, John could be looking at this and seeing a future war coming, seeing a fleet of helicopters moving in and describing them in metaphorical language that a first century Jew would have no clue how to describe other than saying, it's like lion's teeth and, and had like an iron breastplate. Are you with me? That's how a futurist would see it. But if it was an idealistic thing, he could be describing a powerful enemy, and every description represents something different. It's got a crown, crowns of gold. Well, a crown of gold is what a king wears. It's what authority wears. This is a powerful enemy coming with government approval. It had a human face. Humans represent intelligence because we're not animals. Um, so this thing is not like a random, it's not a locust because locusts are, you know, pack animals. They, they just, they go like, they don't really think, but this thing thinks. 
It's got woman's hair. Women's hair is it's it's beautiful. It's long. It's um it's 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 women do their hair lovely, you know. Um, it's attractive, it's alluring, but it's at the same time, it's got lion's teeth, which is cruel, threatening, and deadly. Um, iron breastplates, apparently indestructible, or callous of hearts. So this is tough and deadly. Uh, thundering many horses was overpowering and aggressive, and uh, the scorpion's tail is that we're tormented by the effects of it. Now, these descriptions could describe almost every evil empire in human history. They're very subjective. So in one sense, you could always almost put any, if you're against a powerful enemy, a great Babylon, you could put anyone in that place and say, yes, this describes exactly the people I'm dealing with. But if you're a futurist, you say, no, it's something literal, tangible, that we have to figure out what it is. And when we see it, we'll know it. 